this video, I'd like to talk about how persuasion is used in social campaigns and movements, as well as political campaigns and movements and, and product campaigns and movements. So all different kinds of campaigns and movements, how they develop and some of the major persuasive strategies behind those. It's important to, to recognize that persuasion does play an important role in social movements and other types of campaigns uh, because it's really the only tool that those those organizations and, and those movements have at their disposal. If they had large amounts of weaponry or different things, that would be you know not a social campaign. It would be a, a coup or something like that, and, and, and uh, it's more of a violent takeover. But social campaigns and movements, political campaigns and movements, and product campaigns and movements really rely on persuasion to achieve their goals. So let's talk, first of all, about what makes a campaign. What are we talking about when we say campaign? Let's identify specifics here. First of all, campaigns systematically create positions. Um, they don't just have one single uh, thing about it, but they, they're very uh, selective about what they represent and how they position themselves with the public and with the powers that be. And so they systematically create these positions. They also intentionally design uh, to develop over time. They are intentionally designed to develop over time. They're not an overnight thing. It's not a, you know, one night overnight success. These are things that unfold over the course of weeks and months and years, oftentimes. Right? When we look at things like the civil rights movement, you really, it's hard to pinpoint a, a specific start date and end date, really. But, uh, but we know that it wasn't all at once. It took place over the course of years. Right? So, um, so the, they're, designed to do that though. They're designed to take time. They're designed to take hold over time. Uh, social campaigns and movements will uh, dramatize the artifact, inviting audience participation. By artifact, we mean whatever it is that that campaign is based around, whether it's a politician as a person, whether it's a, an ideological movement, whether it's a product, um, whatever that artifact is, it's being dramatized in a way that, that will um, bring people in. Right. That will, that will draw an audience in and invite them to participate and invite them to become a part of that movement. And finally, social campaigns are, are more sophisticated than other persuasive efforts. It's not the same as advertising, for example, where you just have the same idea, the same commercial, the same product shoved in your face over and over and over and over again, right? This is more sophisticated. This is more subtle. This is more uh, intentionally designed to, uh, to, again, to take time and to involve people in different ways. So um, it's more sophisticated than just the repetition of a, of a, a sales campaign for example. So there are really three different types of campaign, and I've alluded to these already, so we'll just quickly talk about each of them. Uh, one is a product campaign. Um, you can do product. Now, we're not, again, we're not talking about the same as a sales pitch where something is just hammered over and over again. We're talking about developing a campaign, really an idea around a product. So if we think about, for example, some luxury automakers, you rarely hear them advertising a specific product for, you know, a specific model of car or different thing like that. It's really about the, the, the product itself, the brand itself, right? You know that it's good. It doesn't matter what one you get. They're all awesome, right? They're all luxury. They're all, you know, so there's this campaign around this idea of owning a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or whatever. Um, it's not so much about which one you, you have. It's about, it's about the fact that you have one at all. And that says it all, right? So they have these campaigns around these different products, for example, uh, without really specifically providing a sales pitch for any one specific product. They also have political campaigns, obviously. I mean, that we call them campaigns. It's not hard to, to, to see them as campaigns. And they, they do hold all the attributes of, of, uh, of a campaign itself or a movement itself. And then ideological campaigns are the third type of campaign. And these are not surprisingly organized around an idea. So you have the Black Lives Matter movement, you have Occupy Wall Street, you have uh, the Civil Rights Movement, the Women's Rights Movement, the ERA, right? So we have all kinds of different movements uh, that are based around these ideological uh, premises. So, um, and those are the most, probably what we would most commonly identify as social movements and, and social campaigns are around those ideological um, uh, premises. So, 
The components of a campaign are pretty straightforward. They have goals, they have strategies, and they have tactics, and they are kind of arranged in a hierarchical situation. You start with the goals. The organization starts with the goals. What are what are our broader goals here? What are we trying to achieve? And then you develop strategies based to based around how we're going to achieve those, how we're going to get to those goals, right? The strategies will lead us to those goals. The tactics then are how we're going to accomplish those strategies. So we use this, the, the specific tactics to accomplish strategies and to, to, to enact these strategies and then the, that will lead us to our goals then. so really straightforward components of campaigns there are a variety of ways that, that campaigns are developed and the way that they unfold um, and so just want to highlight a few of the major developmental stages of campaigns or the major models that really illustrate these develop developmental stop that, that really illustrate these developmental stages of campaigns okay. So uh, we're going to take a look at these, the Yale five stage development model, positioning model, communicative functions model, social movements model, and diffusion of innovation. So the Yale five stage model, not a surprise, has five stages, right? We start with identification, identification of a need, identification of a, you know, misjustice or identification of a particular product or, or candidate that we want to promote because it can be used for really all of those three different types of campaigns. Uh, then we focus on legitimacy, getting people to take it seriously getting people to recognize the legitimacy of this effort. Uh, then we get participation. We start to it can draw people in. We dramatize that, right? Campaigns dramatize the artifact so that they can pull people in, and we start to get more and more participation. We start to grow in that uh, sense. Then penetration really involves reaching that critical mass of where we penetrate the, the, the social you know, psyche and the social awareness in a broader sense, right? Um, so we can think about Black Lives Matter, for example, was has been around for for several years. It's not a new effort, right? This is a social movement that has has offices and organizations in a number of different cities, and was growing and had moved through those first few stages of identification and legitimacy and participation, but really achieved penetration in the summer of 2020 following the George Floyd murder. Right. So um, then it exploded. Then it became a serious moment. Then you started seeing, you know, the, 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 uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, identified on streets, painted on streets and, and, and streets named after it and things like that. So uh, then we get into the distribution. Once you achieve that penetration, then you get into the distribution of this idea, distribution of this product, distribution of this of this candidate, so to speak, on a broader level. Right. And on a, on a more uh, uh, broader scope or with a with a larger part of the uh, the audience, so to speak, or, the, you know, if you want to call it the audience or the, the public. So the Yale five stage model, you know, pretty straightforward in identifying these five different stages. And if you look at most social movements, you can identify these these uh, stages or, or you can identify where it kind of uh, fizzled out, at which of these stages it kind of fizzled out. But successful. Uh, Social campaigns will move through all five of these models. For products, a lot of time you have what we call the positioning model. This is again most most appropriate with a with a product campaign, but you have the positioning model, and there are a variety of different positions that an organization can take, right? In terms of uh, trying to position themselves with the public, uh, first is being first. You can be the first to do something. You can, you know, and that's pretty self-explanatory, being the first to do something, being innovative, right? Organizations like Apple try and uh, be the first to do something or to, to offer something, you know, and they're very successful at it a lot of times. So that's really kind of their position. They're the first, they're on the edge, they're the innovators. Being the best, you know, maybe I'm not the first, but I do this better than anybody else, you know. Or uh, as an organization, we do this as better than anybody else. If you're thinking about, you know, cell phones, for example, uh, Samsung isn't necessarily the first, uh, but they're uh, considered among the best. I would say, you know, they're the most popular anyway. If you if you want to go with the bandwagon effect, and they're the best in that regard, uh, to have some of the best sales, that, you know, compete with non-Apple phones and non-iPhones uh, and those services, and and so you can be the best. You can try and uh, position yourself in that way. You can be the least expensive. This is where Walmart has made their, their money, right? By being the least expensive, those everyday low values, right? everyday low prices. And uh, so that they're, they're, they make their money on or, or their, their position on being the least expensive. 
you could go the other way and be the most expensive. You know, sometimes people say, well, I don't want the cheapest because that makes me seem cheap. I want the most expensive, whatever, regardless of, of whether it's any good or not. I want the most expensive. So you can position yourself as the most expensive. <clears throat> you can position yourself as what we're not. We're not one of those organizations that does this. We're not these people. We're not, we're not, you know, salespeople are not doing this. We're not, you know, over here. So, or you could, you could be, we're not Walmart. Right? We're not Starbucks. We're not Amazon. We're not these things uh, and position yourself as what you're not. Uh, and in doing so identify uh, with people who uh, don't really care for those types of uh, organizations or those types of positions. So you could, you could play the, what we're not card. You can position by gender. You can appeal to, to men or women, right? To, to people of, uh, you can appeal to male or female. You can really uh, try and focus in on one gender or the other. You can position by age, you know, you can position by age. You can, you can say, we're, we're going to really shoot for this market and we're for, you know, senior citizens or we're for young people or we're for middle-aged people or whatever. We can position by age uh, and, and focus on people in that certain bracket. So for products, you can use this positioning model and one of these positions to really kind of identify yourself and persuade people um, through those uh, positions. The communicative functions model is more about politics. This is something you see a lot in politics and, and you'll see a lot of these terms, right? Uh, you're probably familiar with primaries, nomination, election. And we're not just talking about national level politics here, though. For every political race, whether it's your local town council, whether it's president of the United States, whether it's whatever, you're going to see them move through these different um, communicative functions and, and communicative stages, right? The first is surfacing or winnowing, right? Where we're just trying to be known. We're trying to get on the stage, so to speak, we're trying to have people recognize who we are and, and have people take us seriously, as we talked about a little bit ago in that sense. So we're, we're just trying to get some name recognition and, and get on the, the main stage. Then we get into the primaries and, and so we're trying to eliminate some of our competition, some of our more similar competition, right? Some of our people who may be of the same um, political ideology as we are, maybe in the same party as we are, maybe have the same sort of ideas that we do. We're trying to eliminate some of our nearer competitors. Then we work after we win the nomination, we become that name brand. We become that, you know, that, that uh, we, we've worked to win that nomination. We went, and once we earn it, then we have that, that power behind us of being the nominee. And then finally, in the election, we're going usually against somebody of, of different ideological stripes than us, right? And so we have a different strategy that plays out there and, and different uh, methodologies for reaching the, the community and the voting public, right? So again, this is the communicative functions model. It really relates more to um, the political campaigns or movements. And finally, we have the social movements model, which not surprisingly is, is, is more connected with the ideological uh, campaigns. Um, and again, what we see in the social movements model is that social movements ha have organized groups. It's not just a random bunch of people walking down the street at the same time, even if they're, you know, shouting the same things. Social movements have organized groups. Again, Black Lives Matter didn't just pop up out of nowhere in, in, uh, in 2020. Uh, didn't just, you know, have a bunch of people drawn to it. There, there were organizers that were working on this effort for years. They have organized offices, they have organized plans, they have organized name recognition, all of these things because they have organized groups uh, around their movement. These groups are not institutionalized or recognized by those in power, so they're not part of the government. They're not part of whatever system it is they're trying to uh, to work against and try, not work against necessarily, but change and and uh, get to recognize their particular issues. So they are not institutionalized or recognized really by those in power. Social movements attract large numbers of people and are large in scope. Uh, so again, they reach that critical mass. Eventually, social movements do when uh, to be defined as a social movement. They reach that critical mass where they're starting to pull people in and starting to attract uh, large numbers of people larger than they would have before. So again, we see that in the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, in the summer of 2020. They'd had success in the past. They'd had people uh, marching with them, protesting with them and things, but never to the scope and the scale that they did in 2020. So they're, you know, they really shot off and it took off in and shot up in numbers in uh, 2020. And so they were you know, reaching that that uh, viable social movement stage in doing so. They either promote or oppose social change, depending on what they're 
they're working for, but they're trying to either achieve social change or keep social change from happening. Right. You kind of see that on the, the two sides again in the summer of 2020. You have Black Lives Matter, but you also had another group that was opposing that kind of change. I don't know if they have a name uh, eventually it ended up in the as the uh, you know, sort of the insurrectionists. Right. But um, anyway, it's 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 uh, either in promotion of or opposed to social change in that regard. And they're moralistic. There's something, you know, social movements are moralistic. There's something in their, uh, their feeling about good and evil, right or wrong, good or bad, right? So, um, so there's some sort of moralistic attitude at play in social movements uh, in some regard. They encounter opposition from, from those in power, certainly do. Um, change is hard. People prefer the status quo, especially those who are in power. They want to keep power. They want the, the status quo to remain. So uh, they encounter opposition. Social movements encounter opposition from those in power. Uh, and finally, they see persuasion as the ultimate tool to achieve their goals. They see per persuasion as the ultimate tool to achieve their goals. So uh, again, they're not relying on weaponry or machinery or different things like that. They're relying on persuasion more than anything as a, as a tool to achieve those goals. So again, social movements model has really more to do with ideological movements um, than, than the other types of movements. But, and this last one, diffusion of innovation could, could cross all of these as well, cr cross all three of these in some way. So there's a couple of stages in, dif in the diffusion of innovation. Uh, the first is information or knowledge. We need to be aware. We need to make people aware of the, situ of the situation or the product or, or the politician, right? We need to make them aware and get them knowledge of that to bring it to their attention. Then we engage in persuasion, trying to, to persuade them as to why our view of things and our side of things is correct. Uh, next is the decision adoption and trial stage, which is just what it sounds like. People are making decisions, they're adopting uh, our, our persuasive efforts, they're trying things out, seeing if, it's, seeing if it holds up, seeing if it fits for them. And then finally, confirmation and evaluation, where, where people get locked in then to uh, this certain product, you know, or certain idea. Um, so um, you see this a lot with new new products, for example, um, new phones that come out, uh, smartphone comes out, right? the new one comes out, the, the, the new Galaxy phone comes out, the new S whatever comes out. And uh, so people are, uh, first of all, gathering information. They want to know what, you know, what's the battery life? What's the camera uh, power on it? What's the, you know, what's the, all all these types of things. Uh, what's the speed of the, of the processors? And so we're gathering information. And at the same time, then Samsung is providing persuasion and salespeople are providing persuasion because they want us to buy this thing. Right? So then you'll have some people try it out. People will, uh, people will, you know, take a test run with this thing. They'll make a decision. They'll either adopt it and, and have a trial run. Uh, and then eventually, if, it's, uh, if, if they find the product to be uh, worthwhile, then they will confirm and evaluate it. Right? They'll, they'll confirm that they are indeed uh, pleased with that product and, and will become a user of that product. And they evaluate it and let people know what they thought about it. So those are just some models of the communication uh, of the social movement process and how it can work in different situations, right? But there are a couple other communication characteristics of social media, not social, social movements that I really want to uh, share with you. The first is what we call symbolic convergence theory. Uh, and these are things, again, that, that cross over all these different types of, of, of campaigns. Uh, but symbolic convergence theory tells us a lot, I think, about why people are attracted to certain campaigns and why they follow certain things. So symbolic convergence theory tells us that reality is socially based and socially constructed. Right. Reality is, uh, in fact, uh, uh, dependent on the person in a sense, right? And they, we, we all kind of construct our own reality, and uh, and are and are influenced heavily by uh, our social uh, surroundings. Uh, it also tells us symbolic convergence tells us that that these shared inputs and interpretations are believed, even over those of a respected authority. Right. So we, we, we rely more on the people with whom we're socially involved uh, and we kind of follow along with them to construct that reality. And we depend on that and believe that, find that believe, more believable and trustworthy, even than that of a respected authority. Okay. So uh, again, another example from, from 2020 uh, is the idea of uh, coronavirus. 
right? The coronavirus thing. There were groups of people and pockets of people who had determined, had determined first of all, that it was a hoax in general. And they certainly weren't going to uh, buy into that, despite the fact that doctors were telling them this is real, this is serious, this is, you know, causing the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. They still felt like, nope, this is a hoax. And even if they bought into the idea that coronavirus was real, um, they had trouble believing authorities, you know, and, and saying when they said, wear a mask. You know, people said, I don't have to wear a mask. It's not, you know, it's my individual rights or it's this or that or whatever. And that that filtered into their social group as well. When you have a group of people that are that are together, then one person says, oh, I see you feel strongly about that. So I'm going to follow along with that because our reality is socially based and socially constructed. And as a result, those relationships, those shared interpretations become so strong that they outweigh even the opinion of respected uh, authorities. Finally, some symbolic convergence theory tells us that the resulting shared beliefs result in what's called a symbolic convergence of meaning, meaning everybody's on the same page, that we end up all on the same page. Um, so believing the same things and, and for the same reasons and, and able to spout off those reasons and so forth. So the, there's another theory then that I want to throw at you called Hoffer's model, Hoffer's model. Hoffer's model then says that movements form around men and women of words. So men and women who are particularly effective with their words can, can form these, these moments of movements around them, sort of a cult of personality, right? Uh, these, these people, the, the men and women of, of words, they rely on a few unifying devices to solidify status and gather people to their cause. And we can identify the, the major unifying devices that these people use. They, they go back to them over and over again, and sometimes using some in combination, but, but they use these particular types of, of, uh, uh, of unifying uh, rhetoric and, and ideological uh, bases, right? So uh, one is hatred. They, they spout hatred with white supremacy groups are great at this. They, they, they figure out how to tap into people's hatred and they use that. They could use imitation, you know, pretending to be someone else, pretending to be something else that, so they, they imitate some other uh, group or, you know, so then they have persuasion and coercion. These people will use persuasion and coercion quite heavily. Right? They'll identify leadership and identify themselves as leaders in particular, right? They're the best kind of leadership. They will promote suspicion and make people wonder, right? um, <coughs> excuse me. We saw this a lot in the 2020 campaign. And the, the quote unquote big lie after the campaign about the, the election being stolen and, and so forth. So I uh, had this, you know, sowing the seeds of, of doubt through suspicion. And then finally action. They'll use that as a, as a tactic as well as a technique, technique and tactic to, uh, to get people onto their side. I mean, we saw a lot of this and there's, there's really no getting around the fact that this is really what happened with uh, Trump supporters after, especially after the election, um, that people, he used a lot of these methods, right? He raised suspicion. He used hatred in a lot of ways. He, he identified himself as a leader. It's the only one who could lead and, and, and protect us during this times and so forth. He used a lot of these that were identified in Hoffer's model. So in general, we, we know kind of how these things form and what, what shape they take and what can come next that can be tracked. Um, so it's up to us to then be aware of these things as persuaders and, and understand that um, the process works a particular way and so that we can be better informed about, about what group is in what stage and what they may be trying to get us to do and whether or not we want to go along with that then, right? But anyway, persuasion is the main tool of these social movements, though. It is the primary tool through which they can accomplish their goals or, or not accomplish their goals. If you have any questions about persuasion in general, about persuasion and social movements or anything else related to persuasion, feel free to email me. I'm always happy to respond to emails. In the meantime, you know, be aware of social movements, be aware of the power that they have, be aware of the way that they use persuasion and, uh, and just be again, critical consumers of what we're getting from these groups. Lots of them have really good uh, intentions and really good things going on. Uh, and some of them, or otherwise. So we need to pay attention and be aware of what these groups represent and, uh, and what they mean to us in particular.